Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is David Eichholz uh, with David Richard Gallery here in New York. And uh, today, uh, thanks for coming and uh, hope you've got a chance to take a look at the exhibition. Uh, today we're having a panel discussion with the two artists who shows that are up right now. Uh, Melissa uh, Kretschmer on the right here, and this is the work actually behind us. And then Lee Trincier. And those of you viewing from the camera won't see the work on the other side, but uh, we do have uh, videos on the website and all the images, and we'll try and scan as well. And uh, hosting the discussion today, we're very pleased to have Phyllis Tuckman with us. So um, we're really looking forward to this. And Phyllis told me she has it totally under control. So I was helps. thrilled <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, to get a different perspective and take a view on this work and uh, these two artists. So uh, both Lee and Melissa's first time they presented at our gallery. So we're very excited about that. So this is a really nice discussion to have today that for those of you who are new collector, collectors have been with us for a long time uh, to learn more about these artists and their work. And for those of you who are new to our gallery, welcome. So, uh, Phyllis, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, good to see the two of you again. Happy to have you. Um, so, ordinarily, I might start a discussion with a small topic. But I thought this afternoon we might begin with something really big. Like, why did the two of you make abstract art? <laughs> well, you, you know, I think I think that um, I think that you know it comes from you know a, a long place, and uh, there's a lot of influences um, that you have to think about when you do abstract painting. Um, what what I like is the the old non-objective work, like of neoplasticism, and um, distill. And, you know, when you start looking at that stuff and then you start looking at more contemporary work like, um, like uh, Rothko and, and Sarah, then you realize that there's something, you know, and Leon Polk Smith's a good one I like, but I think that you, you borrow something from everyone and then you can really kind of feel what you're going to do. I mean, I think when you start making hard edge work and non-objective painting, you, you start and you never run out of gas. I think that I think that's something that is is in you. It, there's a lot of reference that comes back and forth, um, you, you know, through life, and you don't jump around. Once you're a hard edge painter, I think you always are. Mm. You know. Well, I I. I think for myself, it's, it's also come from a, a, a deep place within myself and uh, the influence of all the work that I found myself mostly drawn to when I was younger. Um, I, I have to say I did start my studies as an illustrator and gave up my studies in that department halfway through the program because um, I knew a, it was going to kill me. I'd be a lousy illustrator, and it wasn't what I felt I should be doing. And I, um, I'm, I'm just not interested in in like images. I, I basically, I really want to create something that is is unique and doesn't exist in any other form. It's not about recycling images. It's not, it's, it's truly um, like its own language. And, uh, uh, and, I, and I think that, you know, all the work that I've really been most drawn to has been very minimal. Uh, Barnett Newman, Bob Ryman, um, for some reason, I, I guess I can't always figure out what it is about that work that I'm so drawn to, but um, it's always been a draw for me. And I, and I think this is my language. This is my way of expressing myself. Um, and, and you were never tempted um, 
in the 1980s or after when there was a resurgence in um, uh, figurative and representational art with neo-expressionism that just never appealed to either one of you? Uh, no, no. <laughs> no, I actually for me all of that work just makes me want to make my work even more. I mean, I, I think if anything it drove me even further away from all of that. I, I can appreciate it on some level, but I'm just not interested in that. It's to me it's it, it is like taking what already exists and just recycling it. And I'm not I'm not interested in that. I'm like I'm tired of the recycled. So as as a critic, I'm I'm kind of fascinated and I feel like for um, for the last year I've been writing about much to my surprise no one else has been writing about it that there is definitely a very strong third phase of abstract art now that there was the period you know with the with with the apparent well with the show that was at the the, the birth of abstract art that was at the Museum of Modern Art that was in so many countries and then and then abstract expressionism and everything that was on the heels of abstract expressionism in some strange way you could see minimalism coming out of all of that and now we're in another moment um, where I think the two of you are, are participating um, so, so that kind of intrigues me now Melissa why do you work with wood? and the other materials? Um, that came up um, sort of naturally in, in the development. Um, prior to this, I would say, uh, prior to the wood, I was working with glass and tar and, um, and some waxes. <clears throat> and I got to the wood because around that time I had started to make uh, beeswax works on paper and I became more and more involved in making those and I kept thinking well why not make them larger but if uh, that would necessitate me to um, use some sort of rigid structure so it was thin layers of, of wood and I treated I treated the used the wood it was quarter inch ply and I collaged with the wood like I was already collaging with the paper and um, and then slowly the glass pieces just sort of disappeared or dissipated I wasn't interested in that anymore and so um, um, so it's it was really by that means that I got to actually the wood um, but again it was layering in, in, in quarter inch layers. Um, can, so. can you talk a little bit more about your process because I know I was fascinated when I, I came to the presentation you did a, about a year and a half ago and you talked about the paper and mm -hmm. and, and well, your tools and stuff like that. Um, well these these pieces are all uh, I work largely with one inch plywood and it's just common ply. Um, meaning um, it's uh, used in construction and all of that. I tried for a while um, using some better plywood that wouldn't warp as much, but um, the inside of the wood was very sort of uniform in color and without imperfections. Um, <clears throat> so I've, I've, I've stayed with the uh, plywood and the before I do any cutting, I, I have sheets of vellum <clears throat> that I've like pre-painted with like white acrylic paint and I use them in a sort of collage-like way um, and glue them down to the wood as a means of just <clears throat> beginning the work. Um, and then I do the cutting and um, then there's just endless layers of gesso um, for the white areas, uh, because I'm 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 interested in the movement of the uh, of the brushwork on the on the vellum, 
but I'm not interested in my hand at all, so I, um, I try to tone it down a lot because it's not about my gesture, it's just about movement um, in the work. So I'm, I really feel like I'm, <coughs> I, I have, uh, I'm interested in the sort of depth of painting of, of, uh, of, of a surface, but I'm also interested in the physical depth and I want to try to bring the two together. So it's, it's um, um, sculpture and painting together, but, but in, I think of these as paintings more than I do sculptures. So. I, I think that's one of the characteristics of the new abstraction, that, that, that sculpture and painting are combined in a way that we hadn't seen before, but also this layering. I mean, don't you feel that layering is, is, is a new aspect of, of, of working in abstraction that you, you're bringing to this? Well, I have to say, no matter what I've done in the past, it's always been about layering. That's, if there is any, no matter what I have done throughout my years, there are a few key things that keep um, showing up in my work, and that one, one is very specifically layering. Um, and um, I don't know, it's, it's, I think that it lends a sort of temporality to the work, which I think is really important, because it's just not one shot. It's, it's, um, it's like the work grows from, from whatever surface it is. And um, I was thinking about this, I was thinking about um, with Lee's work as well, because she said that she, her paintings are made of many, many, many layers. Now, you can get a thickness in one shot, or you can do it in many layers, and I think that um, there's a great difference in how they're perceived. It's, it's almost like you can sense whether it's in one shot or whether it's been done in, in layers, and I, I think that difference is really important, and I think that's with her work. It's, Similar well, as long as you get the tactile surface that you that you end up with, that's uh -huh. right. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, you know how how many layers. Y you know it's right at the end, and that it functions exactly. So, mm -hmm. And I w I was hoping you would sort of talk about about the shaped canvas and how you how you mm -hmm. decide to sh See. which shapes and whatever. Well. Making a shaped painting, I realized that I not only have to, you know, I have to look at the vacant space as well as the literal painted object. And uh, so since I work with literal shape, I have to work with depicted shape as well. And those two have to work in proportion together with the principles of non-objective uh, painting. and. Um, for, for the painting to function fully. And it doesn't matter what color it is, but as long as it, it has those non-objective principles. Um, and then you know. <laughs> now, I'm familiar with, with um, many of Melissa's larger paintings because I saw her work, you know, in the in the show in Brussels that, that Barbara Rose curated, the post postmodern painting after post painting after postmodern. So, but I'm assuming you have a lot of larger size canvases too. And is yeah. there a difference in determining the smaller shapes than you would if you were making larger shapes? Well, in terms of proportion, you know. The activated painting uh, can come small or large as long as the proportion is right. I mean, if you're using non objective principles, you have to use them so that it works well in each painting. Sometimes it fails, and you have to figure it out so that it, it works. Um, but but it, it's all determined on size and uh, line flat space, all those 
good things. You see, S that scale way. is so important. Yeah. Scale. It's in the, yeah. you have a sense of scale, and I think I have a sense of scale. And you can make something this big that can be monumental. Uh, monumental. Yeah. And you can make something that you know occupies the entire wall that that completely falls apart because it has no sense of, of scale i mean i've gone so far as to e either cut off like a half inch off a side or add a half inch because the, the, there's sort of something just wrong and it, it's um yeah. yeah it's scale yeah it's scale like, it, if you if you took the 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 pink and blue piece and blew it up, I it mm. it you know it may not be as successful. Well, the bands would have to be thicker. Yeah. So. Yeah. This, see, that would kill me. I no. mean, you're 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 working large and you have to give up because I do miss with the computer. I miss writing longhand because there would be days writing longhand and I would look at my handwriting and know that was going to be a bad day. <laughs> you don't have that with the computer. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a good reason to be a writer and not a painter. But, um, but, but Lee, why, why do you feel you have to paint, put the paint down in layers instead of thickly in one shot? I think that's the, uh, that's the amount that, that's needed to reach that tactile surface. Um, you know, as a painter, I'm interested in the painted surface. So um, I'll use, you know, the color, the colors are observed. So I structure the hues around value, saturation, tints and shades. Yeah too much and 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 the bands how do you make drawings there's a lot um, of drawings. before you do that a lot of drawings to different different uh, different uh, sh uh, shapes different uh, colors um, you can you know you can use any two colors as long as the proportion is right but are the drawings are they uh, um, Large. Um, are, are they are they pastel? Are they watercolor? Are they, oh, they're. Um, does that matter? Uh, well, no. You know, as as long as you, you know, you can feel you can make a, a good drawing. Um, but I do use uh, a, a a waxy crayon called Karen Dash, and um, it goes on very opaque. And um, I tape it out on paper, and I do a complete formatted. 22 by 30 drawing and uh -huh. uh, take the tape off and the edges are tight and um, I do numbers of them to it to, like prototypes for the painting. Wow, do you ever frame them up? Yes, yes. They, they cool. Mm. Does there. David know that? Where's David? <laughs> David, <laughs> drawings framed. <laughs> Sounds he, interesting. He has a number of them. Um, now I was gonna I was gonna ask as as we're going along, do you have favorite abstractionists? But you both jumped the gun on that one, which was always something I liked as an interviewer. If mm. yeah, the person you're talking to tells you something before you get to the question. <laughs> so, who are your favorite old masters? Old masters. How far back? Oh. It's favorite old master painters. Yeah. Well, I, I can I can I can think of like Byzantine painting and that gold leaf, mm -hmm. you know, with that black next to it, and it's that simultaneous contrast that happens, um, which I don't think they knew was happening. Um, and you know, you can look at that. You can look at the old masters and. Uh, early Renaissance paintings and, and see the background and you can see the checkered floor. You can see the, the black wall next to the checkered floor and you know that was a that was a reductive painting right there. But they didn't mm -hmm. know they were making a reductive painting but it was. Which uh, which I liked, you know. I always looked at that. You you remind me of the you know the old the panel paintings um, where the, the halo is the most immaterial 
part and, and it has the most um, physicality because it's actually it's the gold leaf and it's and it's actually um, has a like it's embossed or it's been punched which I love I've always loved that work um, yeah it's funny you're saying Byzantine because because I'm from Passaic and someone in England knew that which church Robert Smithson prayed in as a child <laughs> and for the life of me until four years ago, I never knew this church existed there. And it was at the end of um, a long street where my father had his business. And it was like, oh my God. And the church was filled with Byzantine art. Mm. And I love the idea of Robert Smithson. I mean, I think as kids, all of us went to temples and churches and whatever and looked at the art. Mm -hmm. And just intrigued that Robert Smithson was looking at Byzantine icons. Mm. Um, did, mm. I didn't know that. And studied to be an illustrator, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, which was kind of amazing. So I've asked you, Melissa, about the wood and you, Lee, about the shape canvases, but the color is so critical. Mm -hmm. um, how how do you make your your color decisions and how I mean it is critical to the success of mm -hmm. what you're doing the mm -hmm. color well I'll, I'll say I'm actually um, a little bit at a point where I'm I'm there's a less color than there has been in in, in this series, I'm sort of going through, um, uh, I'm trying to figure out for myself like how much applied color I actually need. Um, sometimes uh, a color will just pop into my head. Um, like for example, there's pink slip too around the corner. Um, it was really sort of pink popped into my head because it's sort of like this it's this sort of girly, delicate color in the midst of all this, like, you know, this deep, deep cutting. Um, um, and, and sometimes for me, it has to do with whatever um, the color of the wood is doing. Um, I, I'm actually trying to use both the color of the material and the applied color. And if I apply a color, I'm hoping that it accentuates the colors in the wood. Because this common ply, um, I, can, I can cut down to the glue line, which is the, the dark striated colors. Um, some layers will be more on the pink side, some will be more on the yellow side, some on the orange side. So if I'm sensing like there's a, let's say there's an orangish color coming, maybe a, maybe a green will just set that off a little bit more. So, um, and sometimes it's just like, I, I have no idea and then I walk in one day as I did yesterday and, and I just like blue just popped into my head and there's just like a piece of the stew there's just one little bit of blue down the center so cool um, I think the you know I think there's 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 so many uh, combinations out there that um, you have to just use your observation to really use your color and I'm kind of like breaking it up into use um, and since I'm interested in the painted surface so much um, I'll use a lot of additives to, to kind of like get deep space and flatter space to come forward and have that kind of sensibility about it. Yeah. And you use oils, acrylics? It's acrylic layers of like each each color is about 15 20 layers no um, kidding yeah well you could see it in the seam that um wow yeah. see in a piece i wrote on amy silman a couple of months ago i i i said i thought this third phase of abstraction should be called artisanal abstraction <laughs> i mean that's a lot of layers yeah yeah, yeah but um to reach that tactile 
surface that I want, I think that, uh, you know, they're thin layers. Uh-huh. And I think you could uh, just keep going. Now, do, do, do both of you think of your art as being more conceptual, more about feelings, um, the, the head versus heart question? Well, I have to answer that <laughs> because uh, I, I think that uh, making a non-objective painting, um, it's really about like straight pr- principles and um, I don't think I can get into like feelings, you know, um, and it really is what did Reinhardt say, what you see is it, you know, and uh-huh. I think that's what a, uh-huh. I think you have to kind of consider those principles and stay with those principles mm-hmm. you, you're making. But um, I, I feel a little bit differently about my work. Um, I, I sort of, I, I think, what I think about quite often, I had this experience once when I was um, at Union Square Station in the middle of total rush hour, and um, which, you know, people are darting all over the place and bumping into you, and I happened to be listening to my headphones, and I was listening to Eric Satie, and it was like, I mean, it just, it was like such a, a, a strange um, but wonderful experience, and so I, I think in some ways, um, I feel a little more emotional in terms of my work because I'm I I, I like pairing like the 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 deep obvious sort of cuts into the wood and then perhaps finish a work by as you like this long piece when you get all the way over to the right hand side there are just these little quiet little exacto knife cuts which are like barely visible um, and I I don't think of my work as being conceptual at all I mean I think every you know there's always thought there but I think I'm a bit more of an emotional painter myself cool so. um, now the show that was at the modern about the birth of abstraction that was like a critical thing for art historians um, to like get the history told in 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 a better way better I don't know if that's the right word but did did seeing all of that early abstraction from uh, from the the teens in the twenties have any effect on on what what you were doing? I think that you see a lot of work there that is stored, you know, it's it's not available to look at. Yeah. So when that comes out, you know, how can you not like go see it and see how it you know it sort of activates with you? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That was really well, well, were there any countries that, you know, that th- where you saw work and you went, oh my God, I, I didn't understand this, like the English stuff or, you know, when I had my orals, uh, uh, there, was a, there was a Kupka show at the Guggenheim, which I was asked to write about, except that I was so busy studying for my orals, I never saw the Kupka show. Um, <laughs> But the way they presented Kupka as being like critical, I mean, there, it was just, it was like an encyclopedia of let's mm-hmm. get started. I, I, think, I think it's great. It's like for me to see all that work again in one, one place is uh, just um, a confirmation that um, the work that we are doing, and particularly in this day and age, with the way the art world has changed, um, it's as viable as any other artwork, and you it cannot be dismissed. We are not, you know, we did not just fall onto the earth from outer space. Our work is just as viable, but it's it's sort of. Um, it can be dismissed by people because it's not 
politically, uh, uh, you know, it's not making a political statement, it's not making a social statement, but, but it is on some level. We, we are just as affected by everything else. So, um, and I think uh, abstract artists have had, always had a difficult time with that. Um, because I think also to the to like ordinary people who don't have you know such a wealth of knowledge about art they it's not recognizable to them it doesn't look like anything else but that's that's exactly why I want to keep making my work exactly so, so it's, it's just a confirm seeing that work is just a confirmation that I feel that I'm on the right track I'm like I'm on my own track um, it will come to the surface and then it will it will fall beneath the surface again but um, I think we all just have to stay on our own tracks yeah um, I think that's a great point because many years ago um, Herbert Ferber was very close to Mark Rothko and he and later um, he and his wife kept a 1955 Rothko in storage. It was in impeccable condition. And I remember calling up um, someone I had gone to graduate school with who's like the great conservator of abstract art. And she said it was very rare to have a Rothko in perfect condition. Mm. And it was dark. And when Rothko said he wanted you to cry, in front of this painting, you would cry. Mm. Rachel Maddow would cry, and I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. This, I, I think, I think the power of abstract art is underestimated. Mm -hmm. um, also, I, I think um, for me, it's like a, a, a quiet refuge. Um, again, we've got we're we're, we're overloaded with images and now with the computers and the internet and it's like boom 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 I personally I want to slow things down I want to slow people down and that's uh, that's why I try to keep bringing in like small tiny little details that maybe nobody's gonna see at all but I see it and I know it's there and maybe somebody will see it but I want my work to slow things down. Great. And you're nodding. You're well, nodding. I'm not nodding. I just think that uh, I, it, it, it is a good pair because I'm a little opposite. And um, I want to sort of uh, see a visual impact immediately. And then that's it. You know, I, I want to go faster. Uh-huh. Nice. <laughs> so, it's kind of funny. You know? Oh, so that's yeah. that's cool. Yeah. You're 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 facing each yeah. other yeah, here. Yeah. That's that's <laughs> perfect. Um, can you talk a little bit about your backgrounds, about art school and and early work? And I mean, art school to me is a big puzzle. As far as I see it, people go to art school and then there are critiques, and everyone tries to make you cry. Not, not the art, but the person, which I could <laughs> never funny. have done. Um, I, got my, I got my master's in fine art as, I started at Hunter, and then I ended up at LIU. Um, I learned a lot of technique. I was printmaker. Um, I learned lithography and etching, and I got my master's with that. And when I moved to New York, um, uh, painting was really kind of a big thing here. And I ended up painting, making big, uh, long paintings in one color. So it was always reductive. I worked with a Japanese printer for so long that he was, um, he was kind of a, a spiritual Zen guru. And it was kind of interesting to work with him. Um, and um, so it was the early 80s. And there weren't that many abstract expression, yeah, abstract artists, non-objective non artists. Oh, yeah. Um, and around that I saw, because the East Village was kind of a little juvenile, a little street art, you know, scatter art, 
things like that. And um, but I I knew Olivier Mose and Alan Uglo, and they sort of like geared me towards a few interesting spaces. You know. Um, so it was it was you know that vein. There were a few Phil Sims, um, and they, you know the older guys. So I liked that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's a hard period to go through, right? It, it was. I mean, that was, you know, you either jumped on that bandwagon of that East Village thing, or you split, you know, and you did what you wanted to do. So I never did that. Um, but I always stayed with... Uh, but you, you know, found that, your community of, I of other like It was one gallery artists. in the East Village um, on 9th Street. It was called Mission Gallery, run mm -hmm. by Didi Chapin. And... Um, he was very sympathetic towards uh, hard edge work, um, and um, he did show Olivier, and he did show Alan, and a couple of other hard edge painters, and that was like eighty uh, four, eighty five. So I, that was that, and then Julian Preto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was interesting. But that was uh, early. Yeah. And and you went to art school in California, yeah, because right? Yeah, I had mentioned earlier, so I you could um, go surfing. Well, sorry. No, um, I, I had known since I was a little girl that's all I wanted to do. So um, I knew I was going to go to art school, but I thought I would do <clears throat> the more practical route, thinking that if I wanted to make my own work, nobody could, nobody was going to be able to teach me how to make my own work. But if I wanted something to fall back on, like illustration, there you need to know the skills and the business and all of that. So I started at Art Center College in the illustration department and literally woke up one day in the middle of my studies and realized that it was just, I wasn't going to survive it. So I changed departments and that's when all of my own personal work started. And I did also learn some printmaking um, early on, I was very involved with that, um, and uh, uh, so I got my um, <clears throat> I got my BFA, and then I stayed on um, because the art the fine art department at Art Center when I started was more like the token department for the accreditation, <clears throat> and there were very few students, so I was part of the like the first true fine art class um, to graduate. <clears throat> and um, about that time, Jeremy Gilbert Roth came and he completely turned the department around and he became very important to me. So I stayed on hiding in, <laughs> in school um, and got my MFA. <clears throat> and, then I, uh, and then I moved to New York in 89. Um, I mean, that's really where my my work got started. <clears throat> and are are there are there any abstractionists who you follow today who are at work today? Friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lots of yeah. There are a few. Do you do you read about art at all, or that's like? No, no. Really. I, I, gave, I gave up on reading art criticism. I, I find that so much art criticism these days, it's, it's about <clears throat> the writer who uses art to illustrate their theories. And, and they, they're, not even, they're, they're, they're not even really talking about the art. Um, I sort of stay away from that. I mean, when, when I was at Art Center, we had to take art theory and art criticism, and I got very involved in that. And it was, it was, you know, it was a challenge. But when I moved to New York, and I got working in my studio, I decided that there was no place in the studio for that, and I just shut the door on it. Um, I, I, I don't want my work like governed by any of that. In fact, I'm, I feel rather protective about my work. I, I have relatively few studio visits. I almost don't want to hear anything about it because I just want to see it develop on its own. So, um, uh, 
yeah, I just, um, yeah. And how do you feel about studio yeah. visits? Oh, I, I like them. I think they're great. I think, uh, I think um, you know, having people in and, and getting a little feedback um, um, is great. You know, you, you're finding so many friends on, on Facebook and you could find uh, the blackest black on, uh, with a click. Um, things changed, your brain changed when the computer started. And I think, uh, I think uh, you could find anything now. And you can learn about anything, just Wikipedia. Um, uh, and uh, you, can, you can learn a lot, you know, right there. It's right there on your phone. So, you know. Yeah. So, and so you don't really read art criticism? I, I do. Oh, you do? I oh. do. And, you know, it gives me a headache. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I like... I like uh, you know, like th there's, you know, you, you, sometimes with like hard edge work like this, you, you, you know, you want to read about like semiotics or something about like what Wiener was doing, you know, back in the '60s, and um, and so there's, you know, Foucault and uh, Derrida, you know, and Olivier was Mose was he was really big with Derrida in France, and um, he did a little. Um, a little, uh, you know, a combination with them, a little uh, collaboration with them. Um, but there's contemporary, you know, writers now. Now you can get everything right there you, online. That's what I'm saying. You can read about, you know, their whole oh, I know. articles. It's shocking. I, I sometimes, <laughs> you know, you go to a, a bibliography. I mean, in the old days, you went to a bibliography, right. and then you had to go to the library and find the magazine, and now you just press it, and there it is, and yeah, you read yeah, it. It's all there. Yeah. Um, like at 2 o'clock this morning, I was reading an old article from The New Yorker from 2010, and I'm like, why am I doing this? <laughs> uh, it was interesting. Um, now I'm wondering, I mean, this is just, it's a fabulous show, I think, I think, I think I think your work looks really good. How how do you decide what to include in an exhibition? Well, I work in sequences. Uh huh. So I so one painting generates another painting. Um, so when I th when I think about one idea, I'll just keep going on it until it kind of run, it runs its course, you know. Um, and then the, the, next, the next sequence um, will be similar, but there'll be slight changes, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, you kind of learn from one s series into another. And uh, hopefully you could show it. Mm -hmm. So. And do you work much larger than this? Uh, yeah. I've, uh -huh. I've done um, like six by six. It's uh -huh. about, you know from the East Village Gallery to like the West Village Gallery, I mean the West Village Studio. Um, the walls just got a little bigger, but uh, yeah, I can do that, you know, now. So it's nice to work a little bigger, uh, yeah. Um, well, I, I chose, um, well, I'll, I'll preface this by saying um, prior to this show, I have uh, a show in, uh, in my gallery in Naples, um, and all the shows, most recent shows, before that I had done like really large pieces. And uh, so for my show in Naples, I, I had wanted to show smaller pieces, um, also because the, the pieces now are um, like two, two layers thick. Um, so, and I, I had decided for this show also that I didn't want to show anything like uh, enormous, but um, it's also because of the th thickness. If, uh, and again, when I was saying something about scale, um, if I wanted to uh, make these larger, I'd probably have to go maybe even like three inches thick um, just to get the, 
the scale right for what I have in mind because prior to these the cuts were um, maybe half an inch deep but now with two inches I can go I can cut through um, all the way into the second layer so I get much deeper cuts so um, right now everything for me is is a little more on the small side um, that I, I also like what is this whole thing like everything has to be big all the time and I think this is one of the problems I've seen that happens when um, artists who move from a small gallery and they they're taken up by a very large gallery um, and all they know to do is to blow their work up and it has it shows they have no sense of scale and the work falls apart because they've just blown it up and I'm, I'm, I don't know what this fixation is about having massive works. I mean, I'd rather have something very small and, and intense and with the, you know, with a great sense of intensity um, rather than just enormous. So it's, it's sort of practicality and, you know, I'm also, I just, um, and for these, I try to play around with um, square and rectangular and small and a little bit larger, just to sort of show the, the variations and not um, make sure that I had some horizontal uh, cuts and some vertical cuts. Um, and where do you see your, your art going now? Um, well, I think that um, if you can um, make a painting that's like, that perceptually can function, I think you've made a good painting. I think that's it. So you have to keep going with that. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I'm thinking of now, um, and I'm, I've started making some smaller sort of studies. Um, I was thinking the other night <clears throat> um, uh, about how to get the back side, which is normally like invisible, how to get, how to activate the back side. So I'm actually working on some small pieces um, where I'm actually cutting into the back so that down the side you can actually so it, it was as if I would take this piece, turn it this way, and then turn it face back to the wall so you get the, the little cut. I don't know where it's going, but I'm, I'm trying... I, I, I want every side and every part of the piece to become equal. So inside, outside, top edge, bottom edge, wow. the sides, and if I, can, if I can make the back visible, I would like to do that. So that's, that's where I'm sort of going. Yes, you'll do it. I don't know if it's going to work, but it's just a thought. <laughs> you'll do it. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Sure. Well, I, su I would suppose too that you know, if if you're revealing something, you're also hiding something, you know, in a way. Like I, I personally, and this is where I think that I feel like I'm working from a much more emotional place. Um, I, I can't leave one side without the other. You know, I I want because I I really feel like my life here is that it's like. 
you have you know very upsetting moments and then you have like moments of peace and I sort of want I, I feel like that's what I'm trying to bring together again it's like that experience of being jostled in the in the station and just listening at the same time to this very slow quiet music it's it's but I, I again I think you know when you reveal something it 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 shows you that you're like you want to see more but you know and I'm not cutting up the whole thing but but yeah there is more there I'll definitely say that I don't know, so. Me, you know, making a shape painting, you know, the the vacancy of space definitely has something to do with it. Making a flat, flat depicted shapes inside is very volumetric as as it is. So, with the combined of that and that, that's as, as sculptural as I'm going to get. You know, although it definitely, you know, is volumetric in that sense. As a sculpture would be, yeah, yeah. Although I would never do a 3D piece. I don't, I don't think. So. Yes, I do. Yeah, I make me in stretches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I'm when and I guess this is scale. I'm, I'm again. I'm trying. I'm trying to bring together painting and, and sculpture in some way. However. Um, I'm very, try to be very mindful as to like how far I can come out before I stop, you know, or where I start losing the sense of painting. Um, I think, well, I always thought that Frank Stella is a very good painter that he's not a very good sculptor. And I think he lost a sense of painting when he came way off the wall. And I, I want to retain the painting part of it. So, like I said, if, if I were wanted to get a certain depth um, and then go to a large scale, I might have to add layers, but I'm not gonna come this far off the wall. Uh, then, then it becomes too much. Um, I, w I want to retain a relationship with the wall, um, if, if that makes sense. Tom? Uh, so, 
more shallow underneath than the melissas. But uh, I was just wondering, I guess, if you guys think that, you know, if you think about that, like riding uh, the razor's edge between like beautiful and not. Not making a choice, not having to make a choice. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, I do I do think about that. I, again, I, I don't want to lose one for the other, and I think that they accentuate each other. Um, just like, uh, I mean, I just feel like a, a, a physical cut in a delicate surface is going to make that delicate surface even more it, it, it will enhance its, its depth. Um, um, is that yeah, I mean, an answer? I how you were describing the wonderful way to describe the physicality of the mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I like, I, I always just found that so incredible, it, like the most Invisible, it just has this incredible physicality. Um, and, and maybe maybe it's the fact that it's a halo with that physicality makes it feel more physical at the same time that the, its physicality makes you realize it's like doesn't really exist in, in life. So I, I think they, they accentuate each other. Do you, do you, well, you know, I, I, think, I think making a shaped painting, you, you, you also have to consider the exterior wall, you know, and all that vacant space, and how the viewer is going to look at it, and view it, and maybe see the vision points that are available, you know, and that are there, and just maybe I can, I can know exactly where your eye is going to go. So if I can bring that all together, that's pretty good. <laughs> well, I want to thank the two of you. I want to thank the audience for coming. Uh, the rain hasn't come, so we're all being very blessed. And enjoy the show. Thank you for it.